ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my lecture recital. Before I begin, I would like to express my gratitude towards Professor Song Kate Lee, Professor Samuel Ng, Professor Christopher Siegel, and Professor Jewel Smith for their guidance throughout different stages of this research. I would also want to thank my wonderful colleagues and friends for their patience in reviewing numerous versions of my initial drafts. My lecture recital is titled Performing Nikolai Metner's Fairy Tales, Incorporating Narrative Features and Literature References. Nikolai Metner's Fairy Tales constitute one of his most distinctive composi compositional genres often overlooked by the public. They show Metner's maturity as a composer since he wrote Skessy from 1904 to 1932 spanning his compositional career. There are very few Skessy written for piano solo other than Metner's. The fairy tale genre is mostly found in ballets and operas. For example, Sergei Prokofiev's Cinderella, Tchaikovsky's The Sleeping Beauty, and C Caesar Quay's Little Red Riding Hood. Therefore, Metner's 38 sketches are the exemplary foundation of the genre. They demonstrate Metner's finest writings along with his passion for German and Russian literature. During the compositional period of the 38 sketches, Russia faced two revolutions in 1905 and 1917, which later saw the end of the Romanov dynasty and its imperial system. These historical events inform Metner's fairy tale where he put epigraphs and quotes from his favorite poets, Goethe, Shakespeare, and Pushkin. To better interpret his compositions, we must trace the development of his musical education and his love for German and Russian literature. Nikolai Metner was born in 1880 in Moscow to a family with German ancestry. Even though his family has been established in Russia for two generations, he did not lose his German cultural inheritance. He, he initially prepared to launch his career in piano after receiving an honorable mention in the third International Anton Rubinstein competition in 1900. However, his counterpoint teacher, Sergei Tanyev, and his brother, Emil, both encouraged him to compose. This demonstrates that Metner was a skilled pianist before a composer. His compositional style is influenced pianistically. As Metner wrote in a letter to his brother, Alexandra Metner, on June 16, 1932, no single theoretical knowledge, catalogs, tables, or methods are able to substitute the practical knowledge of the instrument, which gave me the possibility to find the only way of expressing my thoughts. The touch is as necessary for me as inner hearing. It gives me the possibility to imagine difficult harmonies and counterpoints or feeling of the form directed well by my thought. Unlike how other critics have dubbed Metner to be a Romanov without memorable tunes or a Russian Brahms, I argue that Metner's fairy tale are structurally thought out through examining the narrative features and epigraphs from the poets. Metner's main composition are written for piano, including 14 piano sonatas, three piano concertos, three cycle of forgotten melodies, and 38 fairy tales. The genre fairy tale, also known as skatsa in Russian, wonderfully incorporates compositional mastery of harmonies and counterpoint and reference the poetry he admired. According to Heinrich Niehaus, the fairy tale is one of Metner's favorite piano genres, little music novelists. It was originally based on programmed poetic content, even though not indicated. The programmed poetic nature of the sketchy allowed him to fully explore literary fantasies within the context of miniature form. Sketza was not the first term Metner had in mind when he was writing his first set of fairy tale Opus 8. He inscribed the German word Märchen over his first writing of the specific genre. He intended to write plain tales at the beginning of the fairy portion, and the fairy tale portion was added on by the music publisher. The Russian term skatsa refers to folk tale, which could not be simply be equated to fairy tale, as Metner's theme of skatsi ranges from nature, dance, heroic movement to folklore. In this lecture, I aim to combine epigraphs and poetry as reference in Skatsi, along with Metner's approach to piano techniques to form a performance guide attending to his interpretation. The study will be conducted in two folds. The first portion of the research is a comparison of his early, middle, and late period Skatsi, whilst the second portion explores performance practice exhibit 
to exhibit the narrative qualities via thematic unity, paddling, paddling, melodic phrasing, and articulation using Alexandra Karpiev's study on Edna Eels lesson notes with Metner. Edna Eels was Metner's last student taught in Britain, where Metner spent his last days in. I will be performing the respective sketchy after at the analysis of each period. Metner's early period sketchy, Opus 8 to 20, written from 1905 to 1909, are represented by exploration stage, as he started on this relatively new genre. The sketchy during this period is lyrical and subjective mood pieces. Opus 9, number 3, and Opus 14, number 1, Ophelia's Song, show examples of simple form and harmonic progression. Both pieces follow ternary form. The opening section functions to set the scene up with relatively static harmonic progression, whereas the middle section display characteristic short melodic phrases in lilting motion. Opus 20, number 2, Campanella, serves as a transition from his early to middle period with its developing harmonic modulations yet retaining the impression of mood piece. Opus 9, number 3, Sketchy, is in ABA ternary form, based off from the poem Gleich und Gleich by German poet Johann Wolfgang Goethe. The short poem depicts a serene image of a little bee gathering nectar from a flower bell. A little flower bell had sprung up early from the ground in lovely blossom. Along came a little bee and sipped most daintly. They must have been made for each other. The flower bell theme is represented by A section displayed in two against three eighth note patterns. At the return of A section, the flower, the flower bell theme reappears with the B this time in ascending arpeggiated sequence, equivalenting to the first, they must have been made for each other. Similarly, Opus 14 number one is also distinguished in ABA ternary form. Inspired by William Shakespeare's drama, Hamlet, Ophelia's song portrays the tragic character's fate as he drowned into the brook. The piece opens with chorale-like writing that wanders is in F minor. In the middle section, one could see the clear delineation of short phrases including two note and three note slurs. Given the nature of the short melodic phrases in lilting motion, the descending three note figure is interpreted as Ophelia's sighing. Edna Eel's lesson notes, the second note of a two note motif should be played shorter. The long slur across the bar line should be reimagined as a single bow stroked on a string instrument. Further examples of melodic phrasing in Ophelia's song could be found in breath marks and fermatas. Usage of breath mark and fermata enhances the human voice nature. The commas are not a license for taking additional time Rather, it acts as a gasping effect as shown in the example on the slide. The example on the right-hand side of the slide show formatas that function as categorizing each section at a potential point. It is also a display of rounded music and a symbol of Ophelia's song-like quality. Campanella, written in 1909 after the first Russian Revolution, is Metner's bold attempt in writing bell music. One could not omit the discussion of voicing in this piece. 
Campanella presents a curious case to his early period scherzo incorporating the delay of the tonic key in B minor. According to Metner's own words, thunder is heard in the ring of the bell. This, this is portrayed by tremolo and octave leaps in the right hand and descending five note octave figure in the left hand. One of the characteristics of Campanella's being early scherzi is the impressionistic nature of the tale. Metner wrote the title Song or Tale of the Bell, but not about the bell. The most common voicing technique is isolation of the melody. This could be achieved by weight on the thumb having the melody playing legato and other voices as staccato with pedal. serve the purpose of creating the thunder effect of the bell ringing where voicing the melody in the middle voice laid the foundation for his middle period sketchy. Metner also introduced a unique concept, concept of forte solo and forte twos for voicing. In forte solo playing, priority is given to the melody line sempre fortissimo written above the treble clef. It creates vertically shaded dynamics as a form of voicing out the melody. On the other hand, 42s allow both theme and accompaniment to be sounded to create sonority. became dense in polyphonic writing, it is important to maintain clarity during performances. Metner suggests the usage of thumbs to highlight the main melody, putting weight in forte octaves to create a warmer and sonorous tone. I'm now going to play the first three sketchy in the early period. Thank you. 
the middle period sketchy entered ex the experimental stage where the writing is more expansive in form and exhibit frequent modulation and contrapuntal writing compared to his early period. The form expansion closely connects to the extended poem or tale Metner chose. In Opus 34, number one, The Magic Fowling, a seven-part seven rondo form, A-B-A-C-A-D-A, -A -A, is applied, whereas Opus 34, number four, The Poor Knight features contrapuntal writing. The Magic Fiddle, written by Nikolai Gumilev, is a tale matter of reference in Opus 34, number one. The poem surrounds a young boy being tempted by seductive violin music. The A section is the theme of the magic fiddle that occurs alternately between the episodes of the little boy's adventure. The first stanza of the poem introduces the, the theme of the magic violin and the young boy being haunted by the music. My dear boy, you are so happy, every merry, bright and smiling. Do not ask for this sweet fortune that has poisoned worlds away. You don't know. You don't know, you don't know what is this violin. What dark horrors lie in store for one who dares begin to play? The piece exemplifies thematic unity closely knitted with, by the text, and the magic violin theme reoccurs in various expressions that follows the plot. For example, Lagamante, Sognando, which is dreaming in the opening stanza. Lagamente, cantando between episodes and recitato before the final return of Magic Fiddle and the Deathly Dance. In the next two slides, I will be demonstrating the musical extracts from the episodic adventures the boy encountered. If a player's hands commanding take the violin and bow, peaceful light is gone forever from the eyes that make that choice. Towards the end of the piece, the magic fiddle returns with tempo di fauci and the sound of fiddlers vanish as in the poem, the dread death that fiddlers die. Other narrative writing includes the mournful cult and your bride will burst in tears is illustrated with reforzando and accents after rest as a surprise element. At the bottom right examples shows rhythmic momentum of two against triplet, eighth notes with the quote, Go on, boy, you will not find other joy or treasure here. Mendner took the quotation, There lived in the world a poor knight from Alexandra Pushkin. The poem tells a knight in Palestine renouncing all gods but worship the Virgin Mary. In his deathbed, Virgin Mary bears him aloft from the demons that are dragging him to hell. To further the, on the, the usage of commas and formatas as means of melodic phrasing, we observe the addition of rest in the middle per period sketchy to indicate phrasing. The rest often appear in the context of a sequence. Menner indicated the role of each rest, for example, silenza, as dividing the two phrases, irresolute and resoluto, 16th note rest for a gasping effect. Since the piece is highly contrapuntal, with themes interwoven with accompanying voice, voicing becomes a priority in discussion. 
There are two main themes within Opus 34, number four, the poor knight theme and the Virgin Mary contrapuntal theme. During the opening passage, the poor knight theme is presented in the sending stepwise motif and a more detached articulation. The Virgin Mary theme is represented in cantable chordal manner. The two themes interweave before the final coda in G minor, where the Virgin Mary theme is in the soprano voice and the poor knight theme is applied in the alto voice. Metner's instruction on pedaling and articulation are best illustrated at the coda. According to the literature, the poor knight is ascended to heaven by the intervention of Virgin Mary. In the composition, the coda in D major are filled with running 32nd portato notes, melody in the tenor part, and counter melody in the soprano part. It is also marked with poco a poco swift gliando and pedal with vi pedal con vibration. By Metner's principle of using the pedal, we should apply the left pedal for quiet sonorities and sotto passages. The left pedal is held until the left hand octaves melody joins in sempre più animato. At the opening of the coda, one should apply flutter vibrating pedal, but also half pedal in fast accompaniment passages. now be playing the two Opus 34's Scatsies.
mannered rich maturity in compositional style with his late period sketchy. The adaptation of Russian folklore and his ability to compose with complex expression are traits in his entire set Opus 51, surrounding the tale Solushka and Ivan the Fool. Metner did not provide programmatic information for the set Opus 51, apart from describing number two as a song for Cinderella and number six as a dance of the fool. In both number two and number six, we can see the motif derived from motions in the narration. In Opus 51, number six, chromaticism is extensively written in conjunction with the narrative. Metner's Solushka, the Russian version of Cinderella, is heavily infested in his principle of melodic phrasing. It opens with 12 measures of introduction written in A Dorian mode with 16 note triplets marked with a chlorando. As the tempo accelerates, it drew the audience from the narration, once upon a time, to the beginning of the tale. According to Anna Eel's lesson notes with Metner, when playing repetitive passage, the successive one should be faster. Hence, at the echo in measure two and measure four, they should be faster than measure one and three. believes in categorizing music in rounded character and energetic character. Opus 51, number two, belongs to the formal character rounded to form a long line of music. When playing dotted rhythms, always play the long notes longer and the short notes shorter. In the case of this piece, the dotted eighth notes in bracket should be held longer whilst the 16th note should be played shorter. Opus 51, number two, unravels with Cinderella sweeping the floor in the A minor section, dressing up for the ball with her godmother in the modulation passage, and dancing in the ball with the prince in the A major waltz section. In the opening passage, the five note minor ascending motif, A, B, C, D, E, depicts Cinderella sweeping the floor. She is looking up from the depths of poverty. The waltz theme repurposed this motif into descending five note major, E, D, C sharp, B, A figure. Cinderella is dancing in the ballroom looking down joyously from the heights she has attained. During the modulation passage, the unstable key with moving 16th notes arpeggios signifies Cinderella undergoing makeover by her godmother. Within the short span of 24 measures, it bears five different tempi. A tempo, poco a poco più fifo, sempre più fifo, crescendo a più mosso and fifo. After the waltz theme, the recurring triplets in right hand is cycling the introductory material. As the passage marked with Poco a Poco Chalorando, it aligns with the narrative where Cinderella got off from the carriage and was back in her home sweeping the floor. Her dancing in the ballroom was all a dream. At tempo one, shown in the red bracket on the slide, the five note A minor ascending motif recurs. Cinderella finishes her housework and gradually falls asleep. This ending, dreamlike ending, hints on the next tale. Ivan the Fool is the youngest of the three brothers. In the plot, they are tempted by the devil on reputation, wealth, and health. Ivan, who is always generous to his brothers, made it a hard case for the devil to seduce him to sinning. In the end, the simple-minded and kind Ivan cured the Tsar's daughter and ruled the kingdom after the Tsar's death. The main character, Ivan, is represented by a falling third interval motif. It is contrasted by a lyrical leaping melodic line highlighted in green. The piece shows a sharp contrast in articulation, frequently into exchange between portato repeated notes and legato leaping melody.
Opus 51, number 6, vibrating pedal is utilized under two circumstances. In same harmony, A minor 7th broken chord, E minor 7th broken chord, and pedal point accompanied by chromaticism. Towards the end of the piece, middle pedal is used to hold the F pedal note along with vibrating pedal for performance clarity in the chromatic ascending figure. Metner's writing is closely tied to Ivan the Fool's story plot. To intensify the narration, he only placed vertical chordal writing at the climax, highlighted in yellow, where the devil disguised as a nobleman and offered help to Ivan's people and resulted in the devil's defeat. Throughout the piece, only single line repeated notes and linear running passage are heard until the climax. The musical example on the right-hand side of the slide shows the build-up to the return of the main theme with Ivan and his people not tempted by the devil, living contently after defeating the devil. The ascending D minor scale in 16th notes, highlighted in green, is highly chromatic. It helps stir up tension before the recapitulation. It also introduced the chromaticism in the later half of the piece, which concludes in a fairy tale ending. The guided performance practice I presented to you this evening is intended to be recommendations from my research and study of Anna Eels Metner's collection. Even with Metner's quotation and reference, he never explicitly describes the sketchy as programmatic music. He left the performers to decide on which section of the music he is reflecting on a particular stanza of a poem. This evening, I'm able to share seven out of his total 38 sketches with you. I encourage you to explore your unique narrative to the sketchy and develop your performance practice. I will conclude my lecture recital with the late period sketchy, Opus 51, number two and number six. Thank you.